Can You Be a Gay Christian? Part 3. I'm continuing this look at the question, Can You Be a Gay Christian? Uh, mainly what this segment of videos, or I should say this series of videos is about, is uh, what are the bad arguments made to say that you can be an active practice, practicing homosexual? And what does the Bible say? So that's what we're dealing with. I'm only using Lauren Daigle as a starting point. So um, let's continue with this. And like I've said in, in my previous video, I'm trying to be as fair with the arguments as possible. I'm trying to have the utmost integrity also with the Bible. So let's look at some other things. Uh, also want to let you know about some articles that you could look up. Uh, there is a great article called Homosexuality, Fact, and Fiction. Uh, you can find it at the Christian Research Journal, which is equip.org. And so I'm using some of that info plus some of my own as I go through some of the things that you're about to see. So now uh, let's look at four lines of attack used by pro-homosexual denominations. In other words, how do they typically try to justify saying that you can be a Christian and be a practicing homosexual? I mean, after all, they've got the Bible to deal with. Uh, but a lot of times you'll see they don't actually deal with the Bible. Instead, they kind of try to go around it. So one of the things they'll do, number one, is ignore the biblical writers as men who made mistakes. So when Paul said all that stuff about homosexuality, and that's typically who they'll go after, uh, Paul was just a man and he made mistakes. Well, you know what? Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were also men who wrote the Bible. Did they make mistakes too? Did they make mistakes about love? I mean, maybe that stuff is wrong. Maybe that whole crucifixion, uh, death on a cross, for us. Maybe that was a mistake. Maybe the resurrection is a mistake. After all, men wrote those passages, didn't they? That's a really bad argument. And then closely related to it is the next one. The biblical writers were ignorant about homosexuality. In other words, they didn't know anything about it. Uh, I had one of the most ridiculous arguments I should say it went in a ridiculous direction. I had it on Facebook. I know that's hard to believe. I try not to argue too much on Facebook anymore because I've realized that it's just fruitless. Uh, I was uh, We were talking about this subject of homosexuality and what the Bible had to say. And um, this the guy who I was having the argument with, for some reason, brought his church's youth pastor in. And the youth pastor, who was a female of this Lutheran church, made the statement that the writers of the Bible really didn't know anything about homosexuality. And I thought, well, that's curious. Since homosexuality has been around for millennia, and it was just an ignorant statement on the part of this young woman. Uh, I mean, it was so ignorant that an atheist friend of mine who was arguing against me chimed in and said that it was a, a ridiculous statement. Homosexuality has been around for a long time. Now, the word homosexual has only been around since about the 1950s because they created it more as a clinical way to describe this behavior. Because after all, you can't call it sodomy anymore. But homosexuality itself as a practice has been around a long, long time. But here's what Janine Gramic says about this. With the quantum leaps that have been achieved in biology, psychology, sociology, minds in the 20th and 21st centuries must subject traditional religious arguments about nature to more thorough and critical analysis. What does that mean? That means that the Bible is not scientific enough, doesn't know enough about biology and psychology and sociology. Well, that's just ridiculous. Uh, they knew enough about homosexuality. And none of these disciplines will determine whether or not homosexuality is morally right or wrong. Science as we see it today, or I should say as we use it today, is infected with, uh, with naturalism. 
or materialism, methodological naturalism, which means you only deal with the physical. Even your conclusions can't go to the supernatural, and the physical is never going to give you an objective moral right or wrong. You can't appeal to these disciplines to be able to determine whether or not something is pleasing to God. You just can't do it. So this is a ridiculous argument, that specifically that this uh, woman is using. So what else do they say about it? Well, some will say it really does not matter what heterosexuals think, the Bible says, about homosexuality, because homosexuals must interpret Scripture in view of their own experiences. Now, if you know anything about worldview studies, this is what we call postmodernism. This is what we call literary deconstruction where you don't try to find the truth of the passage, you simply ask, what does it mean to me? You interpret it in light of your own experiences. And this means that there is no objective truth. And which, uh, by the way, the person who thinks this want you to believe at least that one objective truth, don't they? But here's how you can demonstrate how ridiculous this point of view is. Simply change the subject a little. Use reductio ad absurdum on it. Uh, show how absurd this argument is. I mean, what if I said it really, it really doesn't matter what faithful partners think the Bible says about adultery because adulterers must interpret Scripture in view of their own experiences. Or it doesn't really matter what honest people think the Bible says about armed robbery because armed robbers must interpret Scripture in view of their own experiences. Do you see how utterly ridiculous that is? But some people hold this point of view. Fourth, and this is what they're really into today, the ones who are uh, specialists in this, is they want to reinterpret traditional interpretations. Uh, in fact, uh, those who are homosexuals who want it to be okay biblically, first they try to avoid what they call the clobber passages, where it is very clear and unambiguous what the Bible's stance is on homosexuality, and then barring that, they will try to undermine the traditional interpretation with uh, exegetical gymnastics. And their gymnastics don't really work, as I'll show you. We're going to look in detail. Now, I'll probably lose some of you when we get into this, but you need to, uh, you need to try to pay close attention, especially if you're one of my students. Why? because you're going to be quizzed and tested on it. You're going to have to be able to get past these arguments. You might be quizzed on it by me at the end of the year in front of class. So you need to know how they try to reinterpret and how to get past the really bad interpretations. So let's look at one. For example, now this one isn't so much a reinterpretation as a really bad argument based on a bad understanding of the Bible. Here you're going to see somebody twist a passage. It's not really what they call a clobber passage, but they try to twist the Bible to make it to make an argument that doesn't really hold weight. Uh, the young man who you see in the picture is a guy named Matthew Vines. Matthew Vines is head of the Reformation Project. Basically the Reformation Project goes around to churches to convince Christians that they need to reconsider the traditional stance on homosexuality as a sin. And, and really, the main message of the Reformation Project is you need to get to know some gay and lesbian people. And then if you'll just get to know them, that'll change your mind. Well, I'm going to tell you, if that's what changes your mind, that means that you don't hold a biblical perspective in the first place. It means that you've totally made your opinion based on your own bigotry. If, however, you know gays and lesbians, and you still hold that it is wrong because the Bible says so, then you have a biblical worldview. And your view is not based on big, big, excuse me, uh, bigotry. Your view is based on the Word of God. Now, that's overall what they try to do at Reformation Project. But let me give you the, uh, the argument of Matthew Vines. This is an interesting argument. It's pretty easy to take apart if you know the Bible, but I want you to see what he has to say about this subject. 
So what is Matthew Vine's argument? Well, here it is. Premise 1. Calling homosexuality a sin doesn't produce the fruit of the Spirit in gay Christians. Now, first, notice there's a little bit of begging the question here, isn't there? He's making an assumption in his premise that he has not proven. He's assuming you can be gay and a Christian. Now, that's only one of the problems with this. So calling homosexuality a sin doesn't produce the fruit of the Spirit in gay Christians. Second, this is the second premise, correct interpretation of the Bible produces the fruit of the Spirit in believers. And then the conclusion, therefore, those calling homosexuality a sin are wrong and worse. Now, what does he mean by this? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Well, if you're not quite sure, uh, what he, he's getting this from the book of Galatians, chapter 22, where Paul writes this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So, here's the problem. The fruit of the Spirit is produced by the Holy Spirit. All right, if you read Galatians, it has nothing to do with what people say and then what that produces in Christians. The fruit of the Spirit are attitudes or life, it's lifestyle characteristic of Christians. Now, I think you could even argue that your circumstances, what people say to you, should have no bearing on the fruit of the Spirit. If you, Paul's point is, if you have the Holy Spirit, you're going to see the fruit of the Spirit it has nothing to do with what people may say to you. And so the way Matthew Vines is using the Bible is totally inappropriate. What I say to you should have no bearing on the fruit that's being produced in you. He's wrong about that, but it, it gets even worse. When he talks about bad fruit, well, if I say homosexuality is a sin and that results in bad fruit, let's say anxiety or fear <clears throat> from somebody who's a homosexual, well, first of all, that, that's not my issue. And that's not even what the Bible ta is talking about when it's talking about bad fruit. Uh, so what he's doing is misusing two passages. He's misusing Galatians 5, starting with verse 22, and he's misusing Matthew 7, where Jesus said this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But disease, a, the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Fruits are just actions or behaviors. What another person, well, if, if somebody says something to me and then bad fruit comes from me, it is not that person's fault. It's my fault. We are the ones who produce the fruit all on our own. The Holy Spirit in us produces good fruit. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't produce good fruit at all. And so what Matthew Vines has done, <laughs> I just thought about this. Boy, it's interesting that his last name is Vines, and he's talking about fruit. I'm sorry, I, I, uh, it's just kind of punny to me. But I, I won't inflict any of those on you. That would make me a rotten apple. We'll talk about biblical sexuality in the next video.